introduction. Um, I'm Phil, I'm a Flink committer, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, stateful stream processing uh, with Apache Flink. So for those of you who um, haven't heard about Flink, um, it's an Apache top level project since um, December 2014. Uh, right now it has become quite active with about 150 contributors working on the project. Um, in a nutshell, uh, Apache Flink is uh, a parallel stream data flow runtime with which you can do stream as well as batch processing. But in this talk, um, I will concentrate on the, on the streaming uh, part. The uh, runtime is capable of uh, giving you low, low latency as well as um, high throughput if you set the, the configuration right. Um, it has a fault tolerance mechanism which gives you exactly one semantics, um, which is nice if you require the correct results. And uh, it lets you do stateful operations, which we'll, uh, we'll see that is really um, useful uh, later on in my talk. But before, let's quickly talk about um, stream processing and why it has become so popular these days. Uh, one of the reasons is that many of the problems we are facing now, for which we use batch systems, are actually a stream nature. So it would make sense to process the events or the data when it uh, arrives, uh, not batching it up, to process this at a, at a later um, time. Um, by doing so, you basically um, have faster results, you don't have to store all the data, and you have more, um, more predictable um, resource consumption in your cluster, because they're constantly processing the incoming events. But since all theory is gray, um, let's Let's look at an example, and this example is going to cover us for the rest of the talk. Um, I want to come with you um, three dimensions. So you have an input stream of events, where each event uh, signifies that a certain tweet has been fed to, to a um, feed. So, um, and now what you want to uh, well, expect from this input stream is how often was um, maybe the, the blue tweet or the green tweet, um, how many impressions uh, did it uh, get over uh, a given amount uh, of time. So what you usually do, or how you would do it is, you um, have the input stream, um, you group according to the tweet, um, then you well, find a kind of um, time frame for computation, because the input stream can be um, theoretically infinite. And doing an infinite um, aggregation or computation will take you uh, infinitely long. So um, you need some kind of, um, let's say, I want to know the impressions for the last hour. OK, that's quite um, easy, I guess, for the example. So how would we implement that with um, a patchy thing? OK, uh, first of all, <coughs> we have to define the um, data type of our input stream. Uh, it can be any Java or Scala type. In this case, um, I've used the Scala case class because they're so nice succinct. Um, one field is the, uh, the ID, uh, which identifies the tweet. Then we have the timestamp when the event happened, and the count value, which will be used for summing up the impressions. Um, next we have to get an execution environment. And in this case, it's a stream execution environment, um, which will tell Flink that we are executing a streaming job. Uh, once we have that obtained, we can use it to, to read from a source. Um, Flink supports various sources like uh, Kafka, WebMQ, file sources, and many others. Uh, but here, I've used my magic uh, Twitter source to directly read from Twitter the, the, uh, the um, impression events. Um, and uh, this will give us a data stream of tweets. OK, so now, um, as we've obtained the tweets, we can start with the actual computation. Uh, the first step was, if you remember it correctly, to split the, the stream into um, well, the events for the individual uh, tweets. And that, that was done, I think, by this key by method, which you give the field name of um, yeah, the type on which it uh, shall group. Next, um, we define our time frame. And um, here, um, yeah, I, I set it to like, create a time window of 10 minutes. 
And within these, this um, time window, I will compute um, by calling sum the, the uh, number of impressions I've received. OK, that's um, the job. Uh, this gives us a new data stream where the um, tweet uh, contains now the counts for, for the impressions um, in the last 10 minutes. And in order to, to execute the program, you have to specify um, a sync. In our case, it's simply printing it out. And then we have to uh, trigger the execution by calling execute. OK. That was um, quite easy, I guess. Um, but already at this um, simple example, you've seen uh, an important concept uh, of stream processing, which is um, giving, we have to, for aggregations, um, we have to define uh, a time frame, or what we call the window. Um, Link comes with um, different uh, notions for windows. The simplest one is the uh, tumbling window, which is basically a contiguous, uh, non-overlapping um, window. So it splits up your input stream into um, segments of four elements, <coughs> in this case. And on these four elements, you can, for example, do the aggregation of uh, summing it up, which will give you, in this case, 27, here we have 22, and 8. Um, slightly more powerful a window is um, the sliding window, uh, which allows you to have overlapping windows. So by defining a sliding window of uh, length 4, uh, so it contains again four elements, to the slide length of 2, which basically says that um, the first two elements of each window are overlapping with the last two elements of the preceding window. Um, you have, have a different um, window semantics which lets you do different things. Um, here, in our example, the window length depends on the, the size, of, on the number of elements. But you could also define it um, depending on um, the time. And um, for time, things are called processing time, which means the time uh, when an element is arrives at an operator, as well as event time, which means the time uh, when, it, when it, an event was created. This is really uh, powerful because this means that we can um, handle all of uh, order elements. So if you read, for example, from multiple sources, uh, it's not sure that, that all ele elements will arrive in order. And for that, you need event time support. And if the, the windows, which are, support, which are like the tumbling and the sliding window, which are uh, supported natively by, by Flink, isn't enough for use case, you can also use uh, quite a custom window with uh, the um, evictor and trigger uh, model thing. That's not a big deal. <coughs> OK, so far so good. Um, the problem with Windows uh, is that they keep the, the data around. So um, as long as the window is not finished and hasn't been computed, you have to store the, the data somewhere. And in case that the window is either really long or um, the, the elements uh, are really large in size, it might, be, might not be feasible to do so. And um, when it comes to counting, we don't really need the information of the uh, events, right? So the only thing we need is um, to know that there was an element, and then we have to increment a counter along that effect zone. So um, to do it a little bit more memory efficient, um, we can create a um, stateful mapper, which simply increments a counter value every time it sees a new element. Um, that's a different way to implement um, a solution for this problem of counting impressions. Mm. How would that look like um, in the API? Well, the only difference to the uh, previous program is that instead of um, a sum, uh, for a, the sum method, we call the map with state method, which takes uh, uh, a function which has two parameters. First, first parameter is um, the event data, so our tree. Uh, the second is the state, which is uh, a long, which you can use with this function to calculate the current um, count value and where we increment it to, to reflect the, the new one. Mm. That is quite easy. However, what happens if, um, well, the machine on which our operator once crashes? Then our data is lost, right? And henceforth, we are counting incorrectly which is uh, not what I've said before, that Link gives you exactly one. Um, processing guarantees. Um, 
So um, there has to be some some mean to to uh, recover from a failure like like a machine outage, for example. And what we basically have to do, or what the system has to do, has to store your um, your state somewhere. And uh, what this basically means is that um, the system has the system has to be capable of um, drawing a distributed snapshot from a parallel data flow. Um, including the operator states. Since um, Flink uses a continuous uh, streaming model, which means that all the operators of your data flow are online at the same time, and the, the events are continuously streamed uh, from one operator to the um, next operator, once they're there um, ready, it's not so um, trivial. So you somehow have to uh, synchronize the individual operators um, and to tell them when to take um, a snapshot so that the um, the, the complete snapshots of every operator gives you a consistent um, uh, consistent snapshot. What this happens with Flink is um, by introducing uh, barriers or markers in the uh, the stream pipelines between the operators. Um, here it's important to note that the these barriers cannot overtake uh, and cannot be overtaken by the elements, which um, are streamed before and behind the, the markers. This means that whenever an operator, let's say, here's our um, state for mapper, sees um, this marker, it knows that there's now seen all elements up to this point. <coughs> and it can now take a snapshot of its state, and if all other operators behave similarly, um, the, the overall um, snapshot uh, will be consistent, can be, can be re, um, recovered that can be used for uh, recovery. Mm. And in terms of processing guarantees uh, in the streaming, streaming world, which are at most ones, at least ones, and exactly ones, with this um, asynchronous um, barrier snapshotting algorithm, how we call it, uh, we can guarantee all of these three um, guarantees. <coughs> it is, um, well, First guarantee, yet most ones actually uh, well, not so useful in real world problems because it basically says that you might see an event in an operator, but um, well, if it crashed, then you might not see it as well. So um, no guarantees at all. It's easy to, to realize. Uh, a slightly harder guarantee, the at least once, basically says that you will see every element once. But in case of, of a failure, might happen that you see or, or it, that you that you process some of the elements um, multiple times, and exactly once means basically that in your final result, um, every element will be accounted for exactly once, and that is the the hardest one actually, uh, but also the most important one. However, as a user, um, just now, usually um, at least one guarantee is. For most use cases, it's sufficient, um, and you would always use or choose the, the weakest guarantee to minimize the overhead. Okay, what would what does does this um, checkpointing uh, now mean for our stateful mapper? Okay, well, if we take a look at it, uh, it looks like before the only difference is that by enabling the checkpointing mechanism, the system inserts these um, barriers into your input stream. And uh, what the operator does is whenever it sees such a uh, barrier, it will take the value it, it has currently stored in this uh, count value and write it to some state backend. In our case, it is HFS here. But this state backend uh, is configurable. And um, but currently, we support um, file systems, uh, well, including HFS. Uh, memory state backend and working, we are currently working on a RocksDB um, state backend. Uh, so for your user function or for, your, for the implementation of that, um, it's completely transparent, so you don't have to bother about um, what's happening behind the scenes. <coughs> okay, um, now let's take a look at, uh, at the performance and what's the, what's the impact of these um, checkpointing mechanism has on, on the overall performance. When we talk about performance in the streaming sector, uh, we always talk about, or uh, we have to talk about latency and throughput. 
these are the, the two important uh, measures. Mm. Due to the fact that Blink has this, this continuous streaming model, um, where, where the, the operator is always online, and uh, once an element has been processed, it can be sent to the downstream operators, it, it can achieve really low latency. Um, but to be precise, in order to also achieve uh, the throughput rate, the elements are not directly sent uh, to the downstream operators, but they are buffered before. Um, and they are sent to the downstream operators once the buffer is full, or once um, a buffer timeout has occurred. And with this buffer timeout, we basically have uh, an upper um, uh, value for upper bound for, for the latency aspect. And in order to show you that, we run an experiment where we had uh, a simple input stream. We went from Kafka, we grouped uh, on, on some key and counted the elements uh, in each group. And we ran this experiment on a 30 node GC cluster with, um, I think it was like four cores and 15 gigabytes of RAM. Um, yeah, there were the specs. And we measured the latency, which is the green line here versus the aggregated throughput. Um, and that, we, we did that uh, for varying uh, the size of the buffer timeout. So starting from zero to 100 milliseconds. <coughs> you can see, with an increasing buffer timeout, um, the latency also increases because the elements stay longer in the buffer and it's, it's more likely that the elements are sent to the downstream operators once the buffer is full, the longer the buffer time it is. Uh, however, the, the um, upside of this is that also the uh, throughput increases. So as a user, you can use this buffer timeout to, to tune your system uh, either to having lower latency or higher throughput. Um, next, we wanted to know what's the effect of the checkpointing um, mechanism on the overall throughput. What we did is we fixed for the same job where we have a, a, a grouping, which means a network shuffle. Uh, we fixed the buff timeout to 50 uh, milliseconds and computed once the aggregated throughput uh, without checkpointing and one with uh, exactly once, so with the checkpointing enabled. And as you can see, for, um, for the without checkpointing, we could achieve. I think it was like 87 million events per second. That's what we can process. Uh, and with the checkpointing of the exactly once processing guarantees, um, we had um, 82 million um, events. So by sacrificing approximately like 4% of, of the throughput, you achieve um, exactly once processing guarantees, which is a really great result. Okay. So much for the um, performance. Now let's um, take a look at the future and what's uh, going to happen uh, within the next month. So now I've, I've talked um, well, about counting. Counting means like having a long value, which is not really a big. However, however, it happens that the state of operators can grow quickly, really large. For example, if you have an NLP, mo uh, NLP model in your operator, then it can easily be um, several hundred um, megabytes. And writing this model to, to some disk to store it um, can take some time. And with the current implementation, the problem is that the um, writing this the data um, out uh, stores the operator and also the, the processing of incoming events which is, for stream processing, uh, well, kind of prohibitive. Uh, so what we are currently working on is um, asynchronous snapshot, so that the, the processing of the events can, can continue while um, storing the, the current state to some um, uh, persistent storage. Um, additionally, uh, we've seen, as I said, some of the state can be really large, um, so that it cannot be uh, kept in the, in the, on the heap. So um, what we additionally uh, work on is an out of core state, so that uh, once your state grows so big that it cannot be held in the memory, that it will gracefully spill to this, uh, where it can also be retrieved uh, again. Uh, that's one, one uh, big thing we're working on. Next, um, we've noticed that during the uh, stream job, the, the load is not always a constant. 
So what you usually do to meet your SLAs is to pro provision for the maximum um, um, well, input you, you can expect. However, this means that most of the time you will waste some, some resources because um, you don't uh, receive this high uh, uh, input uh, weight. So what we want to do, or what we are currently implementing, is um, dynamic scaling in and scaling out, which means <coughs> that whenever Flink detects that there's a slow operator, like for example, let's say here, uh, then it will uh, spawn a new operator so that the, the uh, load is more uh, evenly distributed uh, across all operators and that the, the um, uh, SFAs uh, well, can be kept again. And the same works the, the other way around as well, that whenever an operator um, idles too long, uh, it will be um, the, the DOP of the topology will be, will be decreased so that you don't waste any resources. Uh, However, that only works uh, if like, the, the architecture is, is capable of, of requesting new resources, um, which means new machines, and releasing these machines uh, from a resource manager. And currently we support Yarn as um, such a resource manager, but we have this feature that, that when the job manager sees, okay, I need a new task manager to deploy some more tasks, um, I will um, tell my resource manager, and the resource manager will give me that. And also, when the task manager is idle, it can be released. And um, this will also be part of the um, new Mesos integration, which will also happen uh, in the next uh, month. OK, last but not least, um, there's also some, some other good stuff going on uh, with declarative uh, queries. Um, currently, uh, we have contributors working on Stream SQL which will um, basically bring SQL to the streaming world um, so that you can use um, your SQL knowledge also with streams. Um, and we, we, imp we are implementing um, complex event processing, so that's really easy, um, not touching uh, too much code, um, to detect complex event patterns in, in your, your streams. For example, if you want to um, detect uh, like suspicious behavior in your, your network, uh, you might define some, some rules, and uh, this could, could be used to um, detect uh, intrusion, for example. And with that, um, I, well, yeah, the only thing which is left now is to, to conclude my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you got excited about it and uh, want to well, stay tuned, you should check out um, think that the patch is talk. They will also find the mailing list to which uh, one can subscribe. And, um, Take a look at the code, which you find uh, on GitHub, or follow us on uh, Twitter. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. uh, when snapshotting on the local disk, how do you ensure all tolerance? With local disk, of course, um, they don't have. Uh, you would have to, to uh, save it to HFS, for example, where this replicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 There was a benchmark made by Yahoo, it was also looked by, by you, that mm -hmm. showed very uh, less performance for Flink than what you have shown here. So, how can you explain the difference? Um, well, actually, the, the benchmark done by Yahoo measured the latency of. Um, to say the Redis throughput, um, uh, and the, the results were not bad for Flink actually. They were uh, on par with um, Storm, uh, which is known for having good, really good uh, latencies actually. Um, moreover, here's the, the um, benchmark. The measurement of latency is difficult in uh, distributed settings because the, the clocks might not be uh, synchronized between the machines. So even slight changes will um, disturb the results of your measurements. Um, and the way um, the, the way the Yahoo guys measured the latency was basically that they um, they had a job, then they um, was basically a map operation or the um, well, a group operation, and then they um, in this, this operator they made a lookup to a Redis um, store to, to do a, like a join operation, like. Um, and um, this result, they, they um, 
load every second um, to to uh, some some database to to measure the the latency between um, um, the time point when it was written and the end point of the window of one second. So um, uh, which, which basically means that if, even if you assume you have a latency of zero, um, then the element would arrive in the first window, but wouldn't be written to um, the, the um, store after, before one second has passed, because only after one second it was written to uh, this database. Uh, that way the latency measurement uh, was kind of um, flawed in, in uh, our opinion. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But the overall results were so that, that uh, Flink and Storm were on par uh, with respect to latency. Throughput was not measured there. It's at the moment it's like um, uh, like think of having a, a static uh, query where the data is piped uh, through and then compiled. Uh, yeah, I mean with the API or with um, if you specify it um, as a SQL uh, query, you construct a data flow graph which is uh, um, compiled to some some internal structure which is then used to to um, execute it. Um, the, the specification disability. I want to move away from the rational database to a more open sourcing model of this speed. Um, can Flink help to protect transactions? Um, Flink allows to um, <coughs> um, within Flink the, the uh, you have guarantees that, that there won't be data loss um, using this, this checkpointing mechanism. However, once you, you um, cross the border from Flink to a different system, they have to interact. I mean, the, the system has to, to respect the, the um, these checkpointing notifications to make sure that, that um, no data is written twice, for example. If you do that, then yes. But you have to, to implement it for, uh, for the uh, specific connector you're using there. What do you want to connect with Flink? Uh, say like uh, some type of IoT protocol. Uh, I mean, um, the the way to, to connect with Flink uh, as 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 a client is uh, you have. Um, Use ACA internally, so you have like can can uh, basically send ACA messages. But um, usually, what what you usually do to, to ingest data is you have connectors, and there's a wide variety of actually all Hadoop um, um, compatible stuff which, which is supported. I mean, uh, all Hadoop input formats can be used, but there's no other way. I mean, uh, that's not true. You can use uh, the REST interface to uh, request some some uh, metrics, but there's no other way to interact with the uh, system yet, like uh, other protocols. Uh, not yet foreseen. Why can't use Spark straight Well, you shouldn't use it. Um, but the thing is that they use um, different, um, the concepts are different. Um, Spark uses mini batches to simulate um, streaming which uh, might be enough for some use cases. However, what you basically do is you you, um, um, you don't have such um, flexible window, windowing semantics as with a continuous stream model. Um, that's one ex uh, reason why you, sh uh, you think that the continuous stream model is, is superior. Um, and because of this, this mini-batching, you have um, really high latencies. So if your use case uh, which you want to solve um, requires low latencies, then um, it's almost always not possible to do it with Spark, for example. Take the rest of the questions. Please. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
real key and also the same with string is you have a socket connector, for example, of spark spectrum. On a string spectrum. You can listen for a socket. Uh, yes, yes, that you can do. And, and the difference, for example, mm -hmm. with string in, and with string on spark in this case, you will receive the message and process them immediately as they go inside. And this will be a big differentiator of the spark. 